गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स टुडे ए यूनिक डेट टू डिजिट डोमिनेटिंग 22 यस सेकंड मंथ एंड 22 ईयर गुड सो प्रोफेसर ब्रह्म सिंह हॉर्टिकल्चर फाउंडेशन ए नॉट फॉर प्रॉफिट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एंड माय सेल्फ welcome you all to the talk number 5 of this series named as 4h means urban horticulture for health and happiness and bshf is thankful to bayer semenis to sponsor this webinar series i welcome co organizers dr pitam kalia icr rafi ahmed kidwai awardi and former head division of vegetable science icr iri new delhi and dr shalendra rajan former director icr central institute of tropical horticulture lucknow up the talk this evening is on urban farming an option for future proofing food production by dr prakash p kumar who is professor department biological sciences and director research center for sustainable urban farming national university of singapore at singapore we welcome dr prakash p kumar who honored our request to deliver the webinar friends importance of urban farming can hardly be over emphasized keeping in view the global urbanization 70% of the world population would be urban by 2050 as reported and people building edible and green cities world over urban farming to some people in india may sound funny in context with india having huge but diminishing acreage of agricultural land and other resources needed for farming but increased urbanization a global phenomena where fresh food farming is not only inevitable but appropriate keeping in view the nutrition status in fresh food economics and sustainability to bring nature back to cities rooftop gardens community gardens bio wall vertical garden indoor gardens and alike are cropping up globally in urban areas another positive side of the aspect of urban farming is technology development of soil less farming with many positive and sustainable characters getting preference in urban living singapore with no agricultural land for farming is an ideal example where fresh food mainly fresh vegetables and herbs production is in progress as indoor vertical hydro farming meeting some percentage of locally produced food indoor farms use 90% less water and fertilizers and could be precious sustainable alternative to fresh food production in urban areas today dr p dr prakash p kumar who is heading research center for sustainable urban farming at national university singapore would educate us on progress and potential of urban farming in singapore particularly which can be an example to follow for rest of the world necessitating it friends questions can be raised in chat box or comment which would be attended after the talk 
Now I request Dr. Peetam Kalia to introduce the speaker, please. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, friends. A most respected Padam Shri, Professor Brahm Singh Ji, founder of uh, BSHF, who has uh, very nicely explained the subject uh, in advance so that uh, the viewers uh, can uh, tune themselves to the talk straight. And uh, uh, the today's speaker, Professor Prakash P. Kumar, who is uh, talking on this uh, rare subject, which is futuristic subject for as far as India is concerned, although it's uh, going on very well in country like Singapore, but uh, as explained by Professor Brahm Singh Ji, that uh, we are gearing up towards this and we look forward that the future is in uh, this new technologies uh, to which uh, the people are being uh, accustomed and they are being aware of of their benefits and uh, uh, which could be useful for the future. And uh, uh, Professor Rajan, who is a co-organizer, uh, I welcome you all. Professor Prakash P. Kumar, who has had his early education from India, has had his uh, doctorate from University of Calgary in Canada and joined the National University of Singapore in 1989, where he rose uh, to the position of professor. And now he is uh, uh, heading the Center for Sustainable Urban Farming. And he is a professor in the Department of uh, Biological Sciences. Professor Kumar is a prominent scientist in fields of plant molecular development biology and biotechnology. And uh, he has trained as many as 29 PhD students in his lab at NUS so far, and has published uh, more than 117 scientific papers in pre prestigious journals. Professor Kumar has uh, completed rice research programs in collaboration with the TLL Singapore and uh, IRI Philippines. And uh, in addition, his lab is also working on salinity tolerance using the mangrove tree Abyssinia officinalis. Professor Kumar is uh, serving editor of uh, three international journals, uh, which are very prominent uh, and important and renowned journals world over, Plant Cell Reports, BMC Plant Biology, and uh, Plant Biotechnology Reports. Professor Kumar has held several senior administrative positions at uh, NUS, and serves on national and international committees, including Genetic Modification Advisory Committee of Singapore. Presently, Professor Kumar is Singapore's national correspondent for the International Association for Plant Biotechnology. And he is also the director of the Research Center for Sustainable Urban Farming at NUS, which we have explained earlier also. So with uh, his achievements and uh, the uh, positions he is uh, holding and uh, the contribution he has already made in his field, uh, the viewers are looking forward to hear him on the subject which he is uh, uh, directing uh, in the research center at NUS. And uh, therefore, I would like to invite Professor, Professor Kumar and not uh, not standing between the Kumar and viewers for long. The floor is your Professor Kumar. Welcome. Namaskar, everyone. Let me start by sharing the uh, the, the screen. So I have some uh, slides to to accompany my presentation. So it won't be it won't be all uh, talk and then boring for you, right? So we'll keep it. Turn it on. Have the pointer. Okay. So, uh, hope you can see my slide uh, clearly. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, so, let me begin by thanking uh, uh, respected uh, uh, Professor Brahm Singh for inviting me 
to make this presentation. This sharing session is an excellent thought. I, uh, uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, my session will be beneficial for you, you know, for the, for the just general understanding of what exactly is urban farming and can this be an option for future proofing of food production in the world, right? So let me begin by acknowledging the research funds that we, we have uh, in my uh, my laboratory, the research in my lab, is supported by the Singapore National Research Foundation. Uh, and another grant is from the National University of Singapore. And uh, uh, we also have funding from the Ministry of Education, Singapore. And uh, what you see are the, the happy bunch of people who have uh, uh, been quite active in uh, all kinds of research in our lab. Right. So today's session, what I'm going to do is I've selected this particular topic for the discussion. And what I'll do is just give you a brief introduction on, like, why should we have urban farming? What's the need for it? Right. And then the concept of urban farming. Of course, there are many different types of urban farming that one can be engaged in. Uh, so we'll look at some of this. And uh, then I will talk about some uh, thoughts whether urban farming can facilitate sustainable food production, right? So what I will also do is I'll share with you a few of the things that are happening here in Singapore, right? Can urban Singapore enhance its local food production? So that's the general idea, right? So it has to be practical. So in terms of introduction, we all have heard about the increasing population size, right? And that equals increasing food demand. So this is quite a no-brainer. So one of the key things that uh, uh, we are, we've been working with is that compared to the food production in the year 2011, by the year 2050, that's a span of 40 years, food production will have to be increased by somewhere in the neighborhood of 70%, right? So the world's population is projected to increase anywhere between 9 to 9.5 billion by then, right? So do not be surprised. We are already at 7.8 billion. We have, we have crossed 7.8 billion earlier this year, right? And we're increasing by the minute. So we need to increase uh, uh, food production in order to support the increasing population. What complicates this matter is uh, the extreme weather changes and uh, 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 resulting from the climate change effects, right? So again, we have all been seeing this. The rains have become extreme. The droughts have become extreme in the other direction. Right, so either flooding or drought, uh, and in some uh, countries like in uh, 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 the USA, uh, Canada, this this uh, past year, the summer months, uh, Australia also, there have been devastating fires. Right, so all these have been attributed to climate change, and in fact, the IPCC is going to come up with another set of uh, 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 statements and uh, uh, their projection in the next several days. Um, what we hear from the news report is that they're still working on the, the language they're going to use. And they're going to say it is an alarming uh, situation. And this is going to lead to a big, big problem, even bigger than the pandemic situation we're uh, currently going through. Right? Speaking of which, we are all familiar with what happened in the supermarket shelves, everything became emptied out when there were lockdowns that were announced. This happened in the wealthiest countries of the world, including here in Singapore for a, for a few days, right? Of course, they managed to restock at least with the bare essentials. Uh, the problem is that the, the, the supply chain got disrupted, right? The producing countries had to shut down as well. And so what's going to happen to net importing countries like Singapore, right? So 
this is just given us a taste of what is going to come in the in the coming decades, right? The impacts of this COVID-19 pandemic have been devastating, so, right? So if you look at the countries with severe impact, this is only during the three months of the, uh, the year 2020, the early part of the pandemic, right? So later on, a lot more countries have been through this. So you can see 15 countries were severely impacted within three months of the, the, the uh, pandemic uh, uh, breakout, right? And 10 countries had high impact and about 26 countries had moderate impact, right? This is in three months. Since then, it has worsened really, really. And the number of people that have been affected in the late 2020s has crossed 250 million people. Right. So suffering from uh, food security issues. So the problem, like I pointed out, is going to be worsened by climate change, such as what? Locust crisis, insects. Insects are devastating the crop land, right? Agricultural land. In uh, the 20, 2019 to 2021, this locust infestation outbreak was supposed to be the worst in 70 years in Kenya, parts of Africa, and um, uh, uh, like Ethiopia, Somalia, and it reached India as well. So you can see some of these newspaper photographs, right? So what has happened is that I've, I've highlighted this news report. Uh, so when we talk about locusts, oh, these are small insects, like, like big grasshoppers, like what you see here. They, they feed on green leaves. Anything green they will eat, right? So what happens is, uh, why is it devastating if they eat a leaf or two? What's the big deal, right? Now, the single swarm of locusts, as you can see here, uh, 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 this person is trying to, this man is trying to, like, I don't know, posing there, trying to, to, to clear the locusts. This is a futile attempt. A single swarm can have between 40 to 80 million locusts per kilometer square, right? And a swarm can cover something like 1,200 kilometers square. This is like just simply devastating. Now, each locust eats its weight in plants per day. Right? What does this mean in real terms? So something like 50 to 100 billion locusts can be there per swarm, right? If you take an average mass of two grams per locust, it's a tiny thing. What will happen is that 100,000 to 200,000 tons of, of uh, uh, plant matter will be consumed per day, right? So it's devastating. You thought that was it, no. We have had, this is a pre-existing uh, 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 kind of insect, right? The brown plant hopper, right? Or BPH, uh, Nila Parvata lugens, right? It infests rice and it can cause the so-called hopper burn, right? And this is showing only a small sector, but the, the yield loss can be, the entire field can be burned. So 100% yield loss can happen. So these are problems. These are increasing. The issue of insects boring uh, fruits and the stem, like fruit and shoot borer insects for eggplant, for example, right? So all these are problems, right? So the problems are increasing the difficulties of food production, food security, food sustainability, no matter what name you call it by, right? There is going to be a tough job trying to feed the 9 billion plus population in the world in the next, it's not too far away. 2050 is less than 30 years away. Maybe some of us in the audience may not be here, but a large majority of you who is in the audience is, are quite likely to live through that. And so what we have to do is prepare for it. So what are some of the issues uh, this is an excellent commentary published a few years ago, 2016, but it still is relevant. The key points that they, ra they raised in that include the, the, how the global population is quadrupling, but then the food production is not keeping pace. And uh, like uh, Professor Singh pointed out earlier on, the, the arable land area is declining. 
along with the population it's going the other way around so it's it's making the po- making the problem much worse right so the glo- global food demand is going up because of the population growth and the rising incomes in developing countries that means they are demanding better quality food and more food not just you know a bit of rice is enough kind of situation has changed right so people's buying power increases they buy more food some some uh, people just wasted that's criminal wastage we don't realize it yet but in the coming decades you just will not be able to afford to waste any food Right, so food demand is expected to increase. The agricultural markets will change because the farmers will need to increase crop production, you know, by following uh, climate-friendly policies, right? Ecological and social trade-offs. And the current growth in uh, uh, crop yields is uh, too slow. You need to invest more and uh, uh, conduct more research and increase the food production. Like I've already pointed out, climate change-induced factors may limit agricultural output. Right, so such as, what is this? Climate change-driven water, water scarcity. It's a big deal, right? So uh, th- there are, there are uh, uh, certain thoughts saying that in the coming decades, wars may be fought over water. Right. Uh, Say if there's a river that uh, runs through several countries, the upstream countries may not allow any water to go downstream. And then the countries downstream may start wars to try and get their uh, water rights. Right. Anyway, climate change driven water scarcity, rising global temperature and extreme weather situations, either drought or flooding, etc. They'll have severe long-term effects on crop yields and they've already seen such effects in uh, the Brazilian state of Mato Grosso. A couple of years ago, I was, um, uh, I I had the opportunity to visit that area for a conference and then we took a, a, a week off and they have vast fertile plains, right? And there are lots and lots of rivers there. If you thought the Amazon River is the biggest river system, etc., you know, that's that's just a very small fraction of what Brazil has. They have many, many rivers, right? There's, there's a particular waterfalls there, the Iguazu Falls, right? In front of that, the Niagara Falls looks, looks like a bathroom shower. So the Iguazu Falls expands is about 2.7, 2 point, almost 2.75 kilometers wide. Of course, it's broken in parts with some forest, but that's one giant waterfall, right? So even such areas, they're saying they, they, uh, there will be 18 to 23% reduction in soy and corn output by 2050 due to climate change-induced uh, 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 water scarcity and rising global temperatures. Right, so this is a this is a real thing. Now, unfortunately, some places are going to really, really be affected badly, while some other countries may benefit at least initially from such climate change issues, such as the 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 really cold, frozen north part of China, Canada, and Russia. Why? For obvious reasons, right? For they might experience longer and warmer growing seasons, so their their, uh, arable land will expand in area, right? So Russia is a major grain exporter and has huge untapped potential like what you see here. Huge areas of it. These are frozen lands, but then with climate change, increased temperature, they may become lush green fields as you see in the left corner there, right? So Russia has a lot of abandoned uh, uh, farmland, as you can see here, you know, some of these, you know, grain uh, uh, elevators, loading areas, the trucks come underneath and park here and grain will be loaded to that and so on. These have been abandoned now, abandoned farm business, they may come back into production, right? So what needs to be done for us to ensure sustainable global food supply then? Well, we need to double food production by the year 2050 compared to what it was in the year 2010, 2011. All right. So uh, um, what are some of the issues uh, uh, that can uh, the, the, the uh, actions that will help this? So they left they have uh, uh, given uh, some five, six major points. The food industry should commit 
deforestation free supply chains right and they must do sustainable intensification of production in the current farms reduce the negative environmental impacts right increase long term private investment and public spending in what development research right uh, um, uh, research and development pardon me uh, um, then there should be policies government policies to reduce the risks uh, and to attract more financing and investment in agriculture the global policy makers corporations consumers we all must put a uh, global food balance higher up in the agenda believe me this is going to happen and we will have no choice but to take corrective measures right what scientists have been saying people like me and people like uh, professor singh and people who are in the field are seeing this right the oncoming problems governments so far have been uh, largely ignoring this but we can't ignore this for too long we have to start doing things so what are some of the things that scientifically minded people forward looking people are doing they are increasing the so called indoor farming efforts right developments r and d investment is coming in research and development is going on so there is one example of Uh, such an indoor farming uh, facility this is one of the early generation farms where they're growing it on the soil gr growing plants on the ground i should say but hydroponically without the soil involvement but it's all just a single level thing the company is called app harvest it's a nasdaq listed company and as you can see uh, as you can see the share value went up to almost 40 dollars us uh uh you know about not that long ago right uh 22nd february 2021 right exactly a year ago and what has happened to that now unfortunately the share value has gone down about tenfold right so but these are share market values fluctuating what is this company about it's a company that has set up with a particular purpose right of producing tomatoes and they it's set up by a team they call themselves dreamers and doers what exactly are they doing they have a farm with it's like a 60 acre farm huge right it's one of the largest indoor farms in the usa and they don't use any soil for growing the plants and there's no growing seasons it's not limited by growth seasons they just have to add water and technology and harvest the crops right so they use precision farming tools or techniques such as what ignore the small print in here by the way i use some of these slides for my lectures and it's for the benefit of the students for us for the purpose of today's discussion don't squint and start reading these fine, fine print right so just focus on the main bullet point the side heading here they use recycled rainwater right so they use 100% of their water use is recycled rainwater the uh, uh uh and so there is no harmful runoff water runoff no pollution and they use hybrid lighting system and they use artificial intelligence for controlling the lighting and and uh uh, uh water supply into their hydroponic system and so on they have a uh, robotic harvesting technology which goes and measures or or pardon me estimates whether the tomatoes are ripe for harvest or not and then harvests it automatically and brings it together now with all these things in there what people like singaporean policy makers have been doing is they've been thinking through and then saying okay so we have we are facing these negative effects of supply chain disruptions like in the covid situation so in the years to come with the climate change such disruptions may be much longer and more frequent right so if say india is a rice exporter now if india is unable to meet the domestic demands is india going to export rice to singapore unlikely right so we have to try to come up with policies to to try and get enough food for singapore so what can tiny singapore be doing can it be a significant player in food production we know for certain that we cannot produce 100% of the nutritional needs within the country we have to depend on imports that's something so 
The food production in uh, Singapore by 2019 data, there were very few numbers, about 70 odd vegetable farms, three egg farms, and about 120 fish farms, right? And we produce only about, you know, about 10% of the total nutritional needs. So if you look at uh, the vegetables, about 14%, 15%, and uh, 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 fish, about 10%, eggs, about 26% of the needs here. And the population we're talking about of Singapore is probably a third of, what, uh, of uh, uh, say, the population in the uh, New Delhi area, right? So only about less than 6 million. Okay, so who... Uh, in order to try and answer this, can tiny Singapore be a significant player? We're not saying, can we be food independent, right? Significant player, meaning a certain, uh, a significant percentage of the food consumed here. Can we be producing that? That's the thing that we're looking at, right? So in order to answer that, we have to look at who are the, the, the top food export, exporters in the world now? The top two, number one is the USA, number two is the Netherlands. The Netherlands is much smaller compared to the USA, right? 41, uh, 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 um, you know, land area of the, of, uh, the Netherlands is only about 41,000 square kilometers, whereas land area of uh, USA is 9.8 million square kilometers, right? And whereas Singapore, only 700 odd kilometer square, very tiny, a city state, right? Okay, so we look at this. So what makes Netherlands, despite being a relatively small country, it's much larger compared to Singapore, but relatively smaller compared to the USA, what makes it a food exporter? The Netherlands is the second largest food exporter I pointed out, despite it being a small country, right? What are the reasons? The agri-sector generates large surplus of food exports, right? And they, they only employ about 2% of the labor force. So wh why? How are they able to do this? They have very good geographic location, flat, fertile land. They have intensive and sustainable farming practices. They have continually been carrying out innovation. They have one of the most advanced agri-technology, robots for harvesting, sorting of say things like potatoes, etc. They have good and strategic investments. So this gives us hope, right? So you look at their, still in Netherlands, right? So their, their net consumption or uh, import, I should say, import is significantly lower than their net export, right? So they're, they've done extremely well in the so can singapore be a significant player so you look at the size of singapore this is just about 722 square kilometers and you see a, a few green areas here so these greener areas are less developed and possibly available for farming right these are the the gray areas are all urbanized areas where we have our uh, buildings right so one of the things is uh, can we do this in a landscape uh, area like Singapore, urban area? We really cannot, right? So landscape cities, so traditional farming is out of the question. So what scientists have suggested and policymakers have bought that suggestion is that urban farming is a possible alternative and indoor farming with multi-tier growth racks that could be a solution. This is coming from the idea of how we are housing the population here. With such a small land area, we have lots and lots of park spaces and greenery, et cetera, and we have beautiful roads and good, uh, you know, good uh, general overall environment here. How did we manage this? We have moved people to live in high-rise apartments. We have some, some apartment buildings go upwards of 50 stories, right? 50 floors. So using that idea in a small land area, we can house so many thousands of people. So with a similar idea, indoor farming with multi-tier growth racks, we can grow a lot more food in a small footprint of land area, right? So uh, uh, the other thing is that we are trying to learn from the successes of other food exporters, right? Relatively small countries, but much bigger than Singapore. We are mindful of that, uh, such as the Netherlands, right? So Singapore came up with this ambitious goal that is to produce 30% of Singapore's nutritional needs to be produced locally 
by the year 2030. That's why 30 by 30, right? Uh, up from the current 10% overall production, right? So this is ambitious goal, right? So how is the Singapore government trying to accomplish this? Or how is the government going to support uh, the, the, the goal, right? So improving technologies to increase food production, high yield and resilient genetic lines have to be produced. So they're going to support this by investing in R&D, research and development, and encouraging Singaporeans to buy local produce despite it being slightly more expensive than the, the imported uh, green, uh, 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 food product, for example. So the government has introduced multi-million dollar investments to help develop local farms and improve the technology and come up with innovations, right? So in addition, we said it's only going to be 30% by the year 2030, right? So what are we doing meanwhile? What, what about the remaining 70%? We have to, we know we have to import this, right? Singapore is small, but India being much larger, India doesn't have to import this if it is planned well and if good investment goes into this agricultural uh, production, food production, India can really feed itself and quite a significant percentage of the world population in the coming decades, right? So let's hope that will happen. Uh, uh, so one of the things that policy matters in Singapore is that Singapore has adopted a three, uh, uh, three tranche technology. So the figure here shows you tranche one is diversify import sources. Tranche two is the 30 by 30 uh, goal, right? Grow locally, about 30% at least, right? And then the third is have contract farms overseas come up with a good deal so that a, a significant percentage of the farm produced in, say, countries in the, in the region uh, will be exported to Singapore, right? Of course, they will keep what they need. It's not like they produce everything and then send everything over here. That No country will agree to do that, right? So what is Singapore going to do? Singapore is going to provide the technology and investment needed for improving their productivity. Then the improved product can come here. So what exactly is Singapore doing about this in terms of the, the urban farming idea? So uh, one of the early things, this is this is from the year 2014, right? So August 2014 uh, news report in the news, local newspaper that Panasonic has uh, opened um, an indoor uh, plant growing facility. Of course, Japan has uh, uh, innovated quite a lot about it. Uh, 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 they call them plant growing factories. Right, indoor plant growing factories. Anyway, so what is this electronic giant? Panasonic, most of you probably know, uh, is an electronic giant. What are they doing growing plants? <laughs> See, the reason they did this is to show that their LEDs, the red and blue LEDs that they started producing at that time, can be used to grow plants indoors. So that's the thing, they're drumming up business, right? Anyway, it has changed hands now, but then uh, uh, what are the different options for farming other than just the indoor farm? So people were exploring the options. The early options included, uh, you know, growing this in abandoned uh, uh, areas, right? Or uh, I shouldn't say abandoned, there aren't any abandoned areas in Singapore. Uh, unutilized rooftops, for example. This is a rooftop of a multi-story car park. See, even our car parks have to be multi-story because you just park them in one layer, there isn't enough parking space for everyone, right? So we have multi-story car parks as well. On top of it, the roof is not used. So they, they, they thought this can be used, right? And the idea is that urban agriculture is the practice of cultivating, processing, and distributing food in or around urban areas through intense plant cultivation and maybe even animal husbandry. So what are the various urban farming methods? There are multiple methods. You know, grow plants in vacant plots, right? So countries, larger countries like India, for example, and uh, the USA and Canada, they're doing this. Grow plants in vacant plots. There are every so often you will encounter vacant plots. And then you can establish community gardens. Right? Get the community involved in this. Small plots assigned to different households, they all grow this. 
And then uh, small front yards and backyards, when they're present, you start growing uh, food uh, in there. In fact, a couple of years ago, I was visiting a, uh, you know, uh, uh, my uh, parents' place in uh, Mangalore City, uh, went to the State Bank of India, and as we were entering the front yard of that, they were growing okra, ladies' finger. Right. And then I was talking to the manager and then he said it was his initiative. And what they do is every so many days they'll be harvesting it and they'll be distributing it among the among the employees there. That's the kind of thing. So small front yards and backyards along the corridors and terraces, rooftops of various buildings with or without greenhouse structure it could be open air. Then the indoor farms, right? This is probably the more recent ones. And these others have been explored. This allows, the indoor farms allow intensive cultivation in rooms, which you will see in the coming next several uh, 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 slides. I'll try to convince you that urban farming, the early generation were in the rooftops, right? So this is the multi-story car park. The rooftop of it is used for doing this, right? Uh, a few levels of plant farms, right? So you can see this urban farms in Singapore. Early on, this is what we were doing. And then what happened was that we discovered that more innovation went in and then you can start doing this. These are like about six meters tall, right? You can see multiple shelves in here. Each shelf is growing. You can see the close up here, growing plants, right? So it's controlled by uh, electronically controlled, computer controlled uh, irrigation facilities and so on. It deter it, so there's very little water wastage. And uh, by the way, this company is called Syngrow and uh, they're growing uh, um, um, uh, strawberries among others, right? And certain greens and uh, they're uh, 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 expanding into cherry tomatoes as well in the coming uh, um, uh, weeks. And we are working with them in terms of research. It's, uh, well, the CEO uh, was uh, our former PhD student and we collaborate with them in the research. So you see what's happening now is in, in a limited footprint, you have about 12 to 15 tiers of growth. So you're multiplying the productivity by that number, right? And Many other farms are coming up. So dozens of such farms have come up within a short span of two years now. So this is another company called Sustainer. It's another indoor farming company. And they're producing uh, leafy greens such as kale, that's a brassica vegetable, lettuce, arugula, etc. Uh, mainly the salad greens, right? So they produce something like 600 modest by the country standards. But 600 kilograms of leafy greens, they were not producing before and now we're producing per day which is quite good right and the benefit of this i'll show in the in the coming two slides normally the production is in faraway places right rural farms and then produce has to be harvested and transported to long distances that means it's high carbon footprint right and then uh, uh, subject to uh, uh, degradation of nutrient quality and disruption of supply chain, like in the pandemic, et cetera, it can lead to food scarcity. A lot of food wastage happens, right? So growing food close to where it is consumed will help to address these about problems, right? Of course, the outdoor farms will boost the abundance and diversity of wildlife as well as protect their habitats, right? So, uh, so the thing is that this, this is listing the advantages of indoor farming. What I just discussed is urban farming, which will include some outdoor growths as well. So if you look at focused more on the indoor farming, well, it's space saving, highly productive, multi-level growth on racks, just like I showed you in the picture now. It increases the output by multiple folds. It's not just doubling, it can go up tenfold, 15 fold. Right. So controlled environment means it's not affected by changes in external environment. So LED lights, uh, nutrient solutions, they allow this growth. And so future climate change, it is climate proofing. That is kind of a, a, a good insurance to produce at least some of the food. Right. So food safety. This is good because the food produced here is clean, minimal pest and uh, they don't have to use chemicals like 
herbicides and insecticides they are toxic to uh, they can be toxic to us definitely insecticides are toxic to us because they are neurotoxins right that's how they kill the the, the insects they are neurotoxins it's just that the amount of uh, toxins used is is uh, 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 toxic for the insects because their body mass is very low. Like the, ins the locust is two grams, I said, right? So whereas us, we are about 60, 70, 80 kilograms our body mass. So the, the amount of the toxin that we spray is not immediately toxic, but it has cumulative toxicity. It can accumulate in the, in the nervous system. Anyway, so this is safe. Indoor production is safe for, for us to use. The water usage, this is an important, really, really important thing because climate change induced water scarcity is coming, right? It's coming, whether we like it or not, it's coming. So this kind of agricultural practice, indoor farming uses between 70%, depending on the crop, 70% to 90% savings of water, right? Less water usage. Wastewater recycling would mean that minimal environmental pollution, no runoff, right? Eutrophication, some of you might have heard this, algal bloom in lakes and rivers and oceans, right? So none of that. And you can use uh, technology, high technology sensors. Uh, we're doing some research later, I'll show you very briefly. Monitoring of these crop growth using this kind of technology. And you can uh, incorporate the data analytics, right? Artificial intelligence, et cetera. So what this will do is help us to fine tune the flavor development, right? So many of the flavors, some of the, some of the uh, complaints you hear is, oh, you know, the, the, the produce from these indoor farms, they look, and greenhouses, they look really good, attractive, big, and et cetera. But then when we eat it, it's flavorless or much less flavorful than the traditional farmed ones. Why? Because the amount of uh, uh, um, light irradiation, the temperature, water availability, all these control the secondary metabolite production that generates the flavor. We can, uh, uh, we can perform uh, adequate research and development and come up with the conditions such that in the indoor farms, we can tune it such that we will develop flavorful uh, uh, food and that's high in nutrition, good phytonutrients, like there are several anti-cancer properties, anti-cancer compounds in, in uh, uh, plants like the, the uh, brassicas, the cabbage and uh, cauliflower and these uh, 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 um, uh, broccoli and such plants. They have uh, compounds, for example, called glucosinolates. They're anti-cancer compounds. So you can induce them to produce higher quantities so that they'll be good. Plus, they'll be locally grown, less food wastage, low carbon footprint. So there are lots of advantages. High productivity has been proven by scientific studies. As shown here, the water usage can be between 70% saved uh, or it could be even 95% savings if you use the right technology, aeroponics. And uh, local production, this is shown here. And then the conditions of growth, you can grow seasonal crops out of season and make it available year round, stable supply, et cetera. And the nutritional value, we can fine tune that. And the key thing I highlighted early on, I want to highlight again with this figure here, the, the vertical model allows hundreds of acres of crops to grow on a single acre of land, right? You just have to, Think of growing it higher, multiple levels, right? So it eliminates the need for deforestation. So that's good. So can it be an insurance against climate change? Yes, right? So hopefully the answer is yes by the time you finish listening to this presentation. 70% to 90% less water. Then they don't use pesticides or herbicides and operate in clean environment and close to zero water pollution as a result of this cultivation process. So... Good. Vertical farmings are good. 
But there are certain disadvantages, right? We don't want to wish, you know, uh, uh, make it a wishy-washy thing and then say, ah, everything is good. But there are limitations. You need appropriate varieties for suitable that are suitable for indoor cultivation. Why? Because most of the cultivars that we have are selected for growth outdoors in the traditional farms. We need to reselect them and, and enhance the performance indoors. Because the, the farms require... Uh, electricity used for lights, cooling maybe, and fertigation pumps, etc. hydroponics, right? So it's high energy input. And the taste profile, like I pointed out, of plants may be affected. We need to work out the conditions, find out by re proper research and development. So this just, you know, shows you the energy needed for growing strawberries, right? So the total energy per meter square of growing area is about 272 watts, right? Uh, that is 117 kilowatt hour per month, right? So this is a kind of energy. So calculations are happening and then people are trying to make them more efficient, right? So what will it take for vertical farms to thrive, right? First, we have to ex expand them beyond leafy greens. If you just keep growing lettuce and kale and, uh, you know, uh, these kind of leafy greens, that's not going to be uh, sufficient nutrition, right? It's only one tiny portion salads, that's it. So we have to build an end market. We need people, customers who should be willing to buy this. So we need reasons for them to buy this, right? It's better nutrition and um, um, more healthy and uh, produce phytonutrients, anti-cancer compounds. Uh -huh. So that means customers are willing to buy, reduce the carbon footprint, educate the farmers, and so on. So you need to do all this. Why should we do all this? The market insight says there's an extremely high growth forecast for this industry. So compared to the 2018 3.1 billion, uh, by the year 2026, which is not too far, right? Another four or five years, less than five years away, it's going to go up to 22 billion market value. So what should we grow? Leafy vegetables are the ones that are grown. Why are the indoor farms focusing on this? One of the reasons is that these have a relatively short growth span, right? About a month or so, number one. Number two is that whatever you harvest from the plant is consumed, right? Very little of uh, biomass that is wasted, thrown away because there's so much of investment going, going into it, right? So what are some of the crops that are suitable for indoor production, right? So again, do not worry about the small print. Just look at the, sh uh, the, the highlighted uh, uh, points. Short production cycle for the crops. Yeah, so that's good. So they're desirable. High harvestable yield means the entire biomass is consumed. That is good, right? Say this tomatoes. More than half of the biomass will be the vines, the plant. You don't consume it. You throw it away. Now, what, what scientists are coming up with is coming up with ideas for what we call waste valorization. So from that waste material, which is not used as food, can we maybe distill uh, a new product, which is high value? Doesn't exist now. We have to come up with this. Or... Maybe you can chemically convert that into something that is extremely valuable. You know, could be industrial chemical. So anyway, so that's the thing. The plants should be relatively short. If they are really, really tall plants, they can't be grown indoors, right? They should have year-round demand. So one of the one of the uh, um, um, crops people are suggesting, and many farms are uh, uh, trying these out is microgreens. What are microgreens? You've heard of sprouts, right? Alfalfa sprouts and bean sprouts and so on. Beside, basically, these are them, right? So the idea is that you grow this and then very short uh, uh, stature, high harvestability because almost everything you harvest is consumed. Short production cycle, what, less than uh, four or five days, maybe uh, less than a week anyway. And year-round demand because sprouts are consumed in uh, you know high-end markets and things like that. Right. These are perishable and they should have high value and uh, there'll be value adding, right? <coughs> Of course, so these are crops suitable for indoor production. What else needs to be done to ensure success of indoor farms? In the last several minutes, I'll just focus on these and then uh, uh, end my talk. So 
the examples of uh, some of the key steps to be taken include innovation, right? So reduce water use, energy consumption, use renewable energy, right, or solar energy, uh, uh, enhance recycling, uh, develop smart sensors and use AI for artificial intelligence, right? And monitor crops. What is one of the advantages? The advantage is that you can start to monitor. You can get the signal from the plants at the very early stage they are going through the stress. They're going to, uh, they're going to experience stress, but they begin to give out signals. Now, if we can interpret those signals, we need sensors that can sense it. Then we can avoid the stress situation for the plants. And so the yield decline will not happen. So we can harvest high yield, right? And of course, we need to develop elite varieties suitable for indoor farming, right? In short, we need to develop enduring and sustainable solutions, right? Smart monitoring. We need to develop Sensors. This is. Uh, uh, I'm just going to spend uh, uh, 20 seconds on this. So what they have done is they have developed these sensors for uh, sensing water movement, and they they fix these sensors uh, on watermelon stem, the vine, right, and onto the fruit, uh, the the stalk or peduncle, right, and then before and after the the uh, place of attachment of the fruit, and then they discovered that a scientific phenomenon, they discovered that during the daytime when the, the photosynthesis and transpiration are going on, the bulk of the water goes to the, the leaves and this branch, right? Very little water gets into this, the fruit. The reverse happens at night. So we didn't know this before such a study was done. About 88% of the water from the basal stem gets into the stem, is diverted to the stem. It's almost as if there's a tap here. Someone is closing that gate valve and then letting water go in here. But this, these are kind of things that plants have evolved to do. We have to understand more of this. We need to, perf we need to uh, come up with sensors for this, uh, AI platform, right? Sensors for plants. So with a couple of my colleagues, we are we are working on such a such a uh, uh, project here. As you can see, we have people from the Faculty of Science, our Department of Biological Sciences, from the Engineering Department of Chemical, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering, uh, who are trying to develop those small, tiny, attachable sensors. And from the School of Computing, we have a colleague who is coming in to to uh, uh, um, advises how to interpret the data, collect and interpret the signals and uh, industry collaborate. So the idea is that we have this multi, uh, multidisciplinary team to come up with this kind of sensors that will give us signals of the stress being perceived by plants. There are other research projects going on within our department. My colleague Sanjay Swarup uh, 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 is working on microbiomes right, uh, in uh, relation to sustainable urban agriculture, right? Microbiomes for plants are also equally important, just like they are for us, right? So, uh, you know, consuming yogurt is good for us, right? Because it's got these beneficial microbes in it. And similarly, there are beneficial microbes for plant growth, and they help do many things. We're just beginning to understand this, right? So we're trying to work out that. And our food science and technology department is also involved in similar work. They're looking at alternative proteins, plant-based proteins, etc., right? Artificial intelligence and technology for harvesting and things like that. So what is Singapore doing about it? There's a company started by our NUS uh, former student. Uh, they call themselves... PolyB, right? PolyB.co. Uh, so they're developing drones to assist in pollination of these indoor farms. One of the things is there are no insects. There's not enough uh, wind also. So they, we have to come up with alternative ways. So drones are being developed for this kind of... So a new initiative, uh, very briefly, we have established this research center on sustainable urban farming research at NUS. And I'm the director for this. So our... our uh, idea is to try and leverage on the diverse expertise within NUS and come up with multidisciplinary research approaches to address the three key stages of urban farm production, which is what? Pre-production, production, and post-production phases or stages, right? We need to come up with this because a multidisciplinary 
disciplinary approach has to be there because a plant biologist doesn't necessarily know how to fabricate a sensor or to how to sense or how to how to uh, uh, collect the data from it and interpret the signal in a meaningful way. So we need to have teams like this coming together, right? So we have really broad research scope. Let me not bore you with that. So what are the topics we've discussed so far? The concept of urban farming and the kind of changes we need in agriculture, right? Because the moment we talk about agriculture, all we know is the rural farms. But now we have to have a change in mindset. The need for urban farming in the face of climate change, we have established that. And we know that for urban centers like Singapore, this is a good strategy to try and increase some of its food production. And sustainable food production and how urban farming relates to it is another aspect we looked at. And we have sh I've shared with you some of the examples of what Singapore is doing in this. The last slide is the take home message. How will indoor urban farming contribute to sustainable food production? They have high productivity per unit area. Small footprint, high productivity. Small countries such as Singapore can potentially increase the, their own food production. Now, the message in here is that countries like in India also can set up a certain position. It doesn't mean that you have to do it, but you have the option now. Technology is being developed, and you have the option to develop it locally, right? This will help in situations when supply chain is disrupted, right? Small percentages can be produced in here. Controlled environment crop production means that it's not subject to the effects of climate change, right? Like I pointed out, whether we like it or not, it is coming, right? So we need to be ready for it. So we need to develop the right tools so that we can, at least we can survive. We might not have such huge populations, in the decades beyond 2050, population may actually go down because of various such conditions. So we have to produce uh, at least some of it locally, and it'll be high quality produce because it won't deteriorate. It saves on transportation costs, right? And low carbon footprint. It's not affected by supply chain disruptions, resource saving and energy intensive. And so we need to innovate and come up with uh, uh, more solutions. Uh, so that's my last slide. And I thank you for your, let me stop this. Thank you for your attention. Stop screen. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Prakash, for an extraordinary, illuminating, and stimulating talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Rajan, hmm. could you kindly moderate hmm. the talk? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, as all will ag agree that we enjoyed the talk now it was somewhat different because uh, many facets which were not known to us those were very well uh, explained by dr prakash and we compliment him for a very excellent uh, this excellent talk which was in a very very simple form but the things the advancements which are coming up and very very relevant with the changing scenario have been uh, dealt by him again he has very well uh, introduced the uh, this area why it is required, particularly in, uh, related with the climate change and how the climate change definition is also going to be changed. The IPCC uh, projections, the, how those are uh, be, uh, becoming valid. We are learning more in that area. That's why the urban farming has its own importance. Then uh, supply chain uh, versus urban farming, they say this was very well uh, explained by him, particularly with the, some of the examples like uh, locust crisis and uh, BH, uh, BPH example. Uh, these were the things why we need some uh, certain alternatives. And this is a valued, valid one because uh, global demand is increasing and particularly climate change uh, driven changes are coming up. And uh, this area, particularly the urban farming, uh, is a uh, answer to all of these things, particularly for the sustainable global food supply. And he introduced how the in indoor farm uh, facilities are important 
and how the precision farming can be a part of it and precision farming uh, basically uh, uh, has a its uh, own application because they are uh, they are using the rain water then hybrid uh, lighting uh, systems and ai is also uh, artificial intelligence is employed that is one of the important feature then robotics uh, uh, in involvement particularly for harvesting that has given some uh, value to this and uh, particularly elimination of many of the uh, problems then example of uh, uh, he has given a singapore example particular for urban farming that is uh, with a uh, country where the area is limited and that limited can, uh, can, uh, area is sometimes a question mark for the for production of the fresh uh, fruit animal products and vegetables uh, so that's why uh, the goal which is of 30 30 then 30 percent of how they, they have targeted how the action plan is and for that diversification of the, several uh, suggestions has also been uh, put forth by him the diversification of import sources then growing locally and even uh, contract farming outside also outside singapore uh, this may also give rise to the these all technologies to the other countries where the urban farming not be uh, may not be uh, initially uh, one of the features for these all contract farming but afterwards it may become the indoor plant growing facilities uh, uh, being uh, projected by him those are uh, very very uh, advanced particularly and this uh, multi uh, uh, <coughs> i should say the example given by him with uh, this uh, car parks that was an example how the space can be utilized nobody is thinking about the uh, rooftop of car parks and the multi story car parks how these can be very well utilized for the uh, production singapore example for uh, particularly the indoor uh, strawberry farm this is uh, a specific farm and benefits of uh, uh, this uh, urban farming in singapore it is uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, very very exemplifying and advantages of indoor farming is now becoming very important because of the food safety issue as he addressed and this is one of the most important issue in uh, now coming years because of the chemicals and other regions then technical driven farming because it is and a um, lot of controls can be there and uh, the most important area the flavor development which was lacking particularly most of the time dr uh, doc, uh, this our uh, coordinator they he used to ask about the metabolites and secondary metabolites and bioactive uh, compounds but he also mentioned about the need of the varieties varieties which are very well uh, important very very important for the indoors and the energy inputs energy that is uh, sometimes it requires a uh, lot of investment and for that uh, that one and uh, that's why it is important and if the taste is fortified and the taste profile is manipulated particularly in urban farming that will become an additional advantage to this area so these were the some of the uh, play, play, uh, uh, dimensions which he has given the market value of the indoor uh, products uh, produce plant products uh, has to be increased and this uh, uh, fortification of the taste will be one of the important things and suitable crops particularly he has given any already questioned that that we have to diversify it and we have not to limit only to the leafy vegetables or only salad purpose microgreens example because uh, it is advantage of short cycle and uh, gaining popularity is one of the important uh, uh, part of it and concept of uh, smart monitoring is a uh, key which has to play important role for the is all indoor farming because multi stacking and sometimes uh, six meter uh, height may not be manually possible to man manage and the sensors different sensor the cameras images these will all be analyzed so he beautifully gave an example of the multidisciplinary team where pre production production and post production multidisciplinary team how it is uh, uh, working and ai application is also important and all types of engineers and plant scientists are working together not only electrical uh, engineer but the specialist in computers he is uh, fetching the data and working with the person who is uh, who knows about the crop these are all in advancement which has given us uh, great uh, uh, enlightenment and we are enlightened with the uh, adv advancement which have been made and he has different several dimensions and i compliment him for uh, all these uh, uh, recent knowledge knowledge 
as well as examples which has been very well introduced and discussed and emphasizing the local technology particularly for india was his uh, one of the slogans and that is most important for us for modifying the urban farms with innovation and the local technology thank you very much sir thank you thank you, hey, thank you <coughs> dr rajan uh, dr kalia would you like to add something uh, sir we have had a very nice talk excellent talk as has been very nicely moderated in detail by dr rajan uh, because the entire focus of uh, uh, the indoor and urban farming uh, farming focus was initially as laid by dr prakash is with the respect to climate change that is changing and uh, is expected to further uh, become a problem in future uh, and from that point of view and also that if we produce uh, uh, at a distance then uh, carbon footprints are a major problem uh, that earlier we used to have market gardening where we used to produce in a specific specific environment uh, for a distant market so carbon footprint uh, has become a major problem and from that point of view also the entire talk uh, is uh, a beautifully uh, delivered talk uh, and also the mention which also was highlighted by dr rajan and uh, dr prakash has uh, made a mention of uh, that contract farming so like that there is example in india that uh, some other countries companies are producing gherkins in india uh, and taking back it after processing making it a pickling cucumber because india doesn't take it so that uh, uh, benefit is there to india and uh, singapore also can think of uh, doing contract farming there is a lot of potential for contract farming in india and uh, that is a um, an advantage from indian point of view that small countries who cannot uh, produce much of these things india can produce that for them uh, and of course for india in future they can also get geared up uh, to look for their future and uh, the uh, all, although uh, dr prakash has made a mention of uh, that we need to have elite smart varieties also for such uh, environments because the already varieties we have for outside production they may not be doing that well inside and, and, and we know that for protected cultivation also the outside varieties are not doing well so we need to concentrate upon developing varieties suitable for protected environment uh, for that enclosed environment uh, and as he has uh, so mean that a lot of research needs to go in this sector to meet out all those requirements of taste flavor and because the production is so huge as has been mentioned multifold increase in production where it will go demand is less production is more again the farmers will fail it's happening here with us uh, it has happened especially in horticultural crops where production is per unit is very high so if the varieties are not having something else uh, from fresh consumption they have to go to industry there they must be those compounds uh, that has been talked about bioactive compounds or nutraceutical compounds or any pharmaceutical compounds which our crops are rich in they the new, uh, new, those nutrient dense varieties has to be there then uh, these program will become more successful uh, because uh, the extra produce can be utilized somewhere else rather than fresh so it's wonderful and also valorization that processing uh, uh, value addition program also specially needed for uh, such crops which are grown indoors is required so uh, from that point of view lot of research is needed uh, before actually land in countries like india we need to gear up now not at the later stage normally we happen that until something happens we say that nothing is required now when it's needed then we'll see so at that point of time uh, it cannot be done we need to invest now for our future so with that i think uh, we had a very nice talk and we are uh, overwhelmed with the talk which was excellent and uh, i i hope that viewers must have been benefited tremendously thank you very much thank you dr kalia for nicely adding value to the what dr rajan has moderated the talk uh, subham if uh, some question is there please display uh has the technology for pollination by drone been successfully applied in practical urban farms could you get right. the question sir right yes so so uh, uh in terms of uh, applying so the polybee technology that i've been talking about here it is a parallel development 
so it's it's not something that is a finished product they still it's it's work in progress okay but there are examples so it's it's not a completely novel idea in that sense uh, other countries such as uh, japan have developed something similar so essentially what it does is that these drones will fly they have they have a camera there they will have sensors so they will sense the flower at the right stage and then they will direct a tuft of air at that and that's mm -hmm. going to facilitate the facilitate the pollination, uh, pollination ex yeah. exercise right yeah. so uh, I said parallel. So in terms of what is the other part of it, so they're working out, say, strawberries have been uh, generally, the, the older varieties have been cross-pollinated. So what they're using now here in this particular farm in Singapore is the, the self-pollinating kind. So they, they worked out. These are the tweakings that they're doing, improvement of the varieties. Uh, uh, that are happening in parallel. So it's it's work in progress. There's another question. Uh, it says, other than leafy vegetables, what which other crops are successful? Yeah, so uh, uh, theoretically, we can grow any. So this company that I just uh, uh, sh uh, showed, another company, Sustainir, they've been testing uh, growing even grapes, <laughs> so so indoors, so they're getting crops. But then, is it commercially meaningful? Not yet, right? But things such as crops, such as tomatoes, and then the small statured uh, legumes are being tried out. Things like our green gram and uradal, right? So these are these are protein-rich seeds, right? So these are these are coming, right? So the limitation right now is that the varieties are not the optimal for indoor cultivation. So we need to tweak those. So some more work needs to be done, but there is potential because they're all relatively uh, uh, dwarf plants. So you can have varieties that are dwarf, less than, you know, uh, um, I don't know, about uh, uh, six, between 60 to 90 cm tall varieties are there. So it's a matter of tweaking those and then getting them. So cherry tomatoes and uh, 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 certain legumes, including uh, the green gram, and there are dwarf soybeans. In fact, there is dwarf rice also in the uh, uh, in the literature reported there. They're, they're really, really small, and the yield is maintained at the normal rice uh, level. But at the moment, Rice is not an indoor cultivation crop plant because simply the acreage needed is really, really large. I, I think oh, I, uh, oh, okay. I think the, the, this was a wonderful point that Professor Prakash has given about uh, the pollination by drones because that will add value to it because it will take care of manual intervention. Uh, not only cross-pollinated crops, but in tomato also we need uh, plant to be shaken. So earlier, yes. electric bee used to be done for release of pollen, uh, but the drones will through air will release those pollen. So uh, that will be a, a good addition to it. Yeah, correct. Because what they're doing is that they're making it sophisticated. They'll have these cameras yes. and they will sense yes. the right. It's not just blowing everywhere. It's yes. going yes. to uh, blow at the flowers at the right stage. Directed things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, your stigma should be receptive, otherwise yes. there is no use of having the pollen. Exactly. <clears throat> That's good. Uh, I think over the period, the perfection will come. Uh, yes. You know, uh, yes. Everything is evolving and uh, in an innovative way. So, friends, I think uh, we had a wonderful talk, or you will agree with me. And Dr. Prakash, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, it's a fantastic talk. Sir, you have taken us from... Uh, rural farming to the urban farming and outdoor to indoor farming uh, great and, to future uh, farming, sir. and then uh, present farming to the future farming uh, in a period of 60 minutes or 45 minutes are so wonderful and so many things you have talked about but i tell you friends this is really future farming 
and the farming has to be done that way only. It may not be the replacement of the present uh, farming, what is going on, but this is the addition and facilitating the present farming and releasing the pressure on the present way of farming, keeping in view the lot many things Dr. Prakash has listed, the climate change, the locust and disease management and uh, uncertainty, so many uncertainties. And that's yes. uh, agriculture, you know it, there is no need to repeat it. So to be a foolproof, that's what uh, the proofing word he has used that. Proofing uh, sustainability. Yep. Both the things he uh, justified, we have to look for sustainable and the foolproof system of food production, uh, not fully, but uh, to the extent it is possible. To the extent it is possible and to the extent it is required. Uh, it's not uh, necessary that every country should be sell uh, food uh, uh, reliant. Then what will happen to the export and all that sort of thing? No, that's not going to happen. But uh, it is desirable to have the local food production, particularly of fresh. Particularly of fresh. Problems comes with the fresh. And then the carbon footprint is creating problem for everything. That is there. So to the extent we can reduce it, from the food industry uh, contribution will be there in that reduction of the food print, though we are blamed for that, that we are creating a lot of food prints in a, a different way. So uh, I think uh, the future, uh, what is that uh, yeah, food production proofing? Future food production proofing. We had a wonderful talk on that. And a uh, lot of research is uh, needed that what uh, um, we all agree what Dr. Prakash has said, that we need suitable seed. The varieties or hybrids or crops uh, amenable to these systems and uh, amenable to the new technologies, this artificial intelligent, robotic and all that. Uh, it's a both way process. No? The technology is there, that's also, crops should be amenable differently to the uh, technology and technology should be friendly to the, so then only the um, things will come up, the mutually beneficial to that, whether we, with the intervention of we so-called scientists or scientists of uh, great uh, <coughs> excellence, uh, it has to be done that way. We have to bring them together and deliver. That's what I think our job is. So with these words, once again, I thank uh, Dr. Prakash for such a um, uh, informative, educative, and the futuristic subject uh, as far as India is concerned um, on the food proofing. Food proofing, if uh, not uh, totally food proofing, uh, this uh, fresh food proofing, and fresh food proofing also, fresh food covers so many things, uh, the milk, uh, egg, meat, and whatnot. Uh, you know, the um, he talked about the vertical farming or the indoor farming. Indoor farming is a, a vertical one, uh, and there is a Despomier, uh, father of vertical farming, who has uh, predicted and uh, written a book also yes. on that. Uh, according to him, everything is possible to produce indoor. That's what uh, his beautiful book explain in a different way, not that uh, oh, the sophisticated technologies are evolving technologies are there, but whatever technologies when he wrote the book were available, keeping that in view, he has come out that uh, most of the things, it is possible to grow indoor. And when the climate is not, um, are a uh, lot many factors, so many factors, because the human brain is, uh, you know, uh, something, uh, something, something. So when it goes in a negative direction, uh, you know, devastation uh, is inevitable. So again, the human brain, uh, just perceiving that devastation, have got the precaution and have got the conditions to how to face that. All those precautions are there, uh, present day world uh, scenario. Is there, we are reading everything there, but all preparations of all to meet all eventualities are there. So it's good, they are scientists' job. And uh, with these words, I think I'm very thankful to Dr. Prakash. He has really nicely prepared and nicely prepared to the extent that 
it is uh, uh, understandable and impactable to the uh, people who uh, just uh, are just beginning in the uh, subject of that uh, indoor farming here uh, because of uh, certain different factors. Singapore is advanced because of the necessity it requires is there. So thank you very much. Thanks one and all, particularly uh, Dr. Prakash and the co-organizers and Mr. Subham. Thank you so much. Okay, thank sir. You. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Meet again uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Okay, thank you. Subham, can you display the next uh, flyer? Ah, yeah. um, next talk is uh, there on emerging concept on, again, urban vegetable gardening. So in a different way, we will have it. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, see you. Thanks. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I take leave, sir.